Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 549 of the podcast and it is Wednesday the 5th of May 2021 as I record this. In today's show I'm talking to Ash Fontana about the AI powered business. Artificial intelligence is already part of our lives in the tools and services we use every day. As AI development accelerates, how can authors and small businesses use it as leverage to expand income and opportunity? We talk about how AI development has accelerated due to the pandemic, how natural language generation and other aspects of AI can help authors with marketing and content creation, and how AI could help stop plagiarism, which we would all really like, as well as licensing works in copyright for training AI models and the impact of AI on copyright law, generative adversarial networks or GANs, and why we both still have a positive view of an AI-powered future. So that is coming up in the interview segment. Now, I haven't done a futurist segment on the main show for a while, so I wanted to do a little update on what's been happening in the AI for writing space. Because things have been happening, I just uh, I just thought I'd separate out my futurist stuff into these extra in between episodes. So first of all, Digital Trends reports on the current state of GPT-3. And of course, I've done several shows talking about GPT-3, so you can go back and listen to them if you want to. The, uh, the title is How GPT-3 is Quietly Ushering in the AI revolution, with more than 300 applications now built on top of its API, which is basically GPT-3 is the language model that can generate words. And the API means that um, people can build a program which uses the engine, the GPT-3 as an engine. And it essentially means people can use it to do stuff. And so far, it is generating 4.5 billion words per day. (laughs) Yes, you heard that right. 4.5 billion words per day generated by GPT-3 and applications built on top of it. And when I read this, <laughs> I mean, I've talked before on this show about how you can't beat the machine. But this kind of is funny in many ways because it's so far away from what is possible as a human. I mean, some people who I think are incredible, some writers who are so prolific, like Lindsay Broker, for example, will uh, do a 10,000 word day. And but 10,000 words is way beyond what I would do. I know, you know, so my max output has only ever been between 2,000 and 5,000 in a day. Uh, so 10,000 is, is amazing. But 4.5 billion? <laughs> That's just crazy. So anyway, some of the examples they give are generating letters, negotiating rent discount, turning legal documents into plain English, Q&A on many different topics, philosophical essays, language translation, and things like generating code to create workable, functional functional layouts. And, uh, you know, code is, is basically a language. And I talk to my husband a lot about this because he's, he's a programmer in the uh, statistical, statistical programmer in the pharma industry. And essentially, he's like, ah, so this can code as well. That's interesting. <laughs> Now, while some of these things are fun applications and things that are sort of uh, tests or experiments, there are also some companies that are growing really fast. One of them is copy.ai, which is one of the copywriting services built with GPT-3, so it can generate marketing copy, blog posts, that kind of thing. They are now making a monthly recurring revenue of $67,000 and have just done a $2.9 million funding round. So what we're starting to get is sort of viable companies built on the top of GPT-3. Also quoting from the article on digital trends, it says GPT-3's ability to confabulate is, depending on the context, a strength and a weakness. For creative projects, it can be great, allowing it to riff on themes without concern for anything as mundane as truth. For other projects, it can be trickier. 
there is uh, an example of it essentially generating plausible BS without using the full term. <laughs> Nick Walton of AI Dungeon is quoted as saying, GPT-3 is very good at writing creative text that seems like it could have been written by a human. One of its weaknesses, though, is that it can often write like it's very confident, even if it has no idea what the answer to a question is. And I think this is very interesting because, of course, if you're writing fiction and it generates things it doesn't matter whether it's true or not because it's fiction, then that's fine. But if you're generating an article that is based on a topic that is (laughs) fact-based, then there better be some (laughs) fact-checking and some care in what you use it for. They also talk about OpenAI's countermeasure. So OpenAI is the company that has created or built GPT-3. Countermeasures to defend against bias include a toxicity filter, which filters out certain language or topics, and they're working on ways to integrate human feedback. And I have used, uh, I'm in the beta of the GPT-3, and if you generate something that could be construed as offensive or biased, you get a little warning. It doesn't necessarily stop you, but I'm sure if you are um, typing, I don't know, racial hatred things in, it's going to flag that up. And so they are really trying to look at integrating human feedback and try and check the bias. Now, of course, remember that this tool is built from pulling human words off the internet and various other things. And of course, humans are biased. So it's not a surprise that it's going to be biased. But what we are obviously what OpenAI are trying to do is stop that from happening or try and change that. Now, I have a list of AI writing tools at thecreativepen.com forward slash AI writing. And you can also find a list of applications that use GPT-3 at gpt3examples.com. So on to another uh, article, which several people have sent me, The New Yorker reports that the computers are getting better at writing with the subheading, whatever field you're in, if it uses language, it is about to be disrupted. And uh, these articles were all posted in April 2021. So it says that essentially they profile one of these GPT-3 applications called Pseudowrite, S-U-D-O-Write. And what it essentially does is, and you can go there, you can go to Pseudowrite. It is in beta at the moment, but they've got some screenshots and things. Maybe by the time this goes out, it will be more available, but is specifically designed for more creative work. Whereas some of the ones I list on well, for example, copy.ai, you know, there's a lot that are sort of aimed at the marketing area, but PseudoWrite seems to be particularly aimed at the creative side. They have uh, some quotes from Amit Gupta, who's one of the founders of PseudoWrite. He left Silicon Valley for a career as a science fiction writer and found a glorious fusion of the two when GPT-3 appeared. And this is a quote from him in The New Yorker. Other artists have had tools like this for a long time. There are really sophisticated tools for visual artists, whether it's Photoshop or a 3D tool. There's all these things that you can apply. People who are using 3D models aren't using clay. They're not using the tools of the past. And this is interesting because actually my brother, uh, Tom, is a designer, a fashion designer, and he now designs on 3D models. And my other brother, Rod, is a photographer. Amit carries on, they're not using the tools of the past. They're using really advanced tools that automate a lot of the process. But writing has been stuck in the past. We're not using paper and pen, but we're not much better off than that. So interestingly, uh, so he says, uh, Gupta imagines the product turning into a resource that writers will pay 15 to $20 per month to use. Okay, so that's what they've put into the article. And what we've seen with some of the other systems that are using GPT-3 is they're definitely, as we will go into in this interview today with Ash, there are things, uh, tools that are being built that are totally accessible to many individual businesses. Many of us pay $15 to $20 for lots of different things, uh, tools in order to, to build a business. So I think that's really interesting. The article goes into some sort of quite... I guess you'd expect it from the New Yorker, but some more philosophical questions. For example, the um, journalist uses PseudoWrite to continue Kubla Khan by uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And 
he said it, it, it generate he includes the generation in the article and he said i find this beautiful memorable if you told me that coleridge wrote it i would believe you <laughs> but what is writing this who is writing this in a sense coleridge wrote it he articulated the pathways of its manufacturer i suppose that i could be the author in so far as i selected the passage and pressed the button or thinking broadly the author of this passage is the entire corpus of human language process through GPT-3. And I love this kind of bigger thinking about it. And that's obviously what I've been talking about on a number of these shows where I've talked about GPT-3 and, um, you know, what, what does this mean? What are the ethics of this? It's very, it's very difficult. <laughs> um, but what he says, uh, Gupta says, is the writer's job becomes almost as an editor. Your role starts to become deciding what's good and executing on your taste, not as much the low-level work of pumping out word by word by word. You're still editing lines and copy and making those words beautiful, but as you move up the chain, you're executing your taste. You have the potential to do a lot more. The artist wants to do something with language. The machines will enact it. The intention will be the art, the craft of language, an afterthought." And it's so funny to hear the word, like to read the words, the craft of language and afterthought is total anathema. I mean, that's blasphemy for so many people in the writing niche that it kind of, um, I realise that a lot of people will not agree with that, that for some people, poets, for example, literary fiction, the craft of language is not an afterthought. <laughs> it's very much in the forefront of people's minds. And what's interesting is for me, generating word by word by word is actually how I I think. So in many ways, I can't see myself using it like this, but I am certainly going to be paying, what do they say, 15 to $20 per month to use a tool that might help me in my writing. I just don't know how it will help me in my writing yet. And I've played with this and I've talked about it a number of times. So that's pseudo write and built on GPT-3. And also the final article I wanted to mention is VentureBeat has reported on how Huawei have trained the Chinese equivalent of GPT-3. And it's even bigger. And it's called Pangu Alpha. In experiments, the researchers say that Pangu Alpha was particularly adept at writing poetry, fiction and dialogue, as well as summarising text. A focus group tasked with evaluating the model's outputs found 10% of them to be unacceptable in terms of quality. <laughs> but obviously, that means 90% was acceptable in terms of quality. And the researchers observed that some of Pangu Alpha's creations contained irrelevant, repetitive or illogical sentences. Again, that happens quite a lot in my first drafts. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the issue of bias, which comes again from training on data generated by humans who are biased. This article in VentureBeat has an ending which I think is very important for us to think about. A paper published by researchers from OpenAI and Stanford University found that large language models, developers like Huawei, OpenAI and others may only have a six to nine month advantage until others can reproduce their work. Eleuther AI, a community of machine learning researchers and data scientists, expects to release an open source implementation of GPT-3 in August 2021. So I've talked about Many of the things in this AI space being two years, three years, five years away, but we are, this is moving very, very fast. This is moving faster than I expected, to be honest. And I'm finding that a lot at the moment. I think what happened in the pandemic is so much speeded up. Uh, it's crazy, the pace of change. But how they end this article is the co-authors of the OpenAI and Stanford paper suggest ways to address the negative consequences of large language models, such as enacting laws that require companies to acknowledge when text is generated by AI. So that was that article um, came out on the 29th of April 2021. So only like a week ago as I record this. But this is the first time I've seen a call for laws that require companies to acknowledge when text is generated by AI. And I have so many conflicting feelings about this. And I, you probably do too. So I have a few initial thoughts. But again, it's something that I think we have to keep muddling through because this is all new. But first of all, as I said earlier, you cannot beat the machine by going faster. So there is a very much a trend in the indie author community to write 
faster, a book a month, all this stuff. But that is not going to be the thing that differentiates us. When, when people get hold of these tools and they're more readily available, they are going to put out more books and faster. More books is not the thing. You cannot beat the machine. But the answer, of course, is to double down on your humanity, to demonstrate you are a human with photos, your the, your voice in your emails to your readers, video if you can bear it. I know many people keep their um, self more secret, but you don't have to put your face on. Like you can do Instagram pictures of your dog or your garden or just show that you are a human and humans are more (laughs) well-rounded than a GPT-3. Develop a relationship with your readers so they choose to support you. Coming back to someone like Lindsay Baroka, for example, she shares pictures of her dogs on uh, social media. She, she's a very private person and doesn't, doesn't share many pictures of herself, to be honest. I think I, I think I took her profile photo when we were in uh, New Orleans together a few years back. But um, essentially, you know, sharing pictures of your dogs, your garden, have uh, declare your humanity in your emails, your social media, all of that type of thing, your website if you have one. So that's one thing is double down on being human, and that's why. I'm now focusing so much, or obviously I have this podcast and I have books and travel, which is more for my uh, other side, my darker side, uh, my travel side. But you know that I'm a human, right? I mean, the fact that I talk about this stuff and I stumble over my words sometimes and all these things, I am a human. And there will be a voice double that's really good probably this year as well. But I will definitely be, I personally will tell you if this is my voice double. (laughs) Uh, But I also, so that's one thing. I do also like what Amit Gupta said in The New Yorker, that these are really sophisticated tools and uh, people who are visual artists use things like Photoshop and they automate and improve things. So for example, I like taking pictures and I will often use a filter. I'll often use editing things. I don't use Photoshop, but many people do. And what's interesting is if we look at photography competitions now, and people who assess photography as an art, there are, you know, people will declare whether photos are natural or it might be a hash no filter on Instagram. And then there are competitions where they allow minimal editing, for example, um, framing a photo, you know, cutting off various bits in order to frame the subject better. Uh, others for photos that use enhancement and others that almost use maximum amount of effects and Photoshop in order to make them more fantastical and very different from the original. So I feel like we almost need this. And in fact, my husband and I have talked about this around sports and the Olympics and things like taking drugs and dosing in order to build the human body. Like there's biohacking with natural elements and then biohacking with technology and drugs and technology in many ways. And so we were like, you know, maybe you need the Olympics where you have Olympics where you say, I am a natural, I am natural, (laughs) I'm not enhanced. And then you just allow people to go for it with full enhancements. And that's the category for biohackers, for example. And I, I feel like we need to have this conversation about declaration of use of these tools. Now, I am using several tools right now. I'm using, um, an iPad to read off. I'm using a laptop to record. I'm using an app. I will use Amadeus Pro to record and edit. I will use WordPress to, you know, send this out. And I'm not going to credit those tools with everything. I use Scrivener to write my books and I don't credit Scrivener uh, in the back of my book. But this is potentially different. I mean, I do credit people's books I've read in the back of my books, I do credit quotes that where I've used other people's, you know, a quote from someone's book. I credit, like I've credited here as I've talked, I've credited the publications and the people who've said the things I'm talking about. So I declare the use of these things in some way. Now, we need to decide as a community how we are going to declare the use of AI in our writing. But the question there becomes, well, what kind of writing? So I was thinking, so I know some of you will be thinking immediately, well, of course, you must declare that it's AI written. But, you know, inevitably, people won't. We know that humans plagiarise, humans publish plagiarised works all the time. And they're not declaring this is a plagiarised book. In the same way, people are going to publish 
books generated by AI and not declare it. But that's not who we're talking about. We're talking about what we want to do and what we think. So, for example, if you use a copy.ai to generate Facebook advertising words, do you have to declare at the bottom, these words were generated by copy.ai? Probably not. Um, So for marketing and ad copy, do you declare you used AI? Question mark. (laughs) What if you are a freelance writer creating blog posts for a client? So you're being paid to write content for a client. What if you use one of these tools um, under GPT-3 to help you write that blog post? Do you need to declare that to your client? Another question, what about on your own blog? What if I use GPT-3 to write an article, let's say, nine ways to improve your first novel? Okay, how many... (laughs) That could definitely be generated by GPT-3 at this point, because let's face it, it's pretty much always the same. (laughs) So that type of blog post is hardly going to be original. But should you say if it's on your blog and it's got your name on it, whether you used help for that? And then the question is, after that, what about a book that you publish, either under your name, a pseudonym that you co-write? How should you attribute this? And this is not, at the moment, this is not a legal standpoint, but it's more of an ethical one. And I'm not telling you right now, I'm actually asking you, because I still don't know. I think that what I just gave you was a gradation of where we might declare the use of AI tools but I know that many people will feel that they don't want to. Now, there are writing competitions already that require you to warrant that your words are your own work. And I have entered some of these recently and I have made sure I I have been very careful to only use my own brain for these projects. So I can definitely say, yes, I warrant this is my own work. And what they do mean is don't plagiarise or take someone else's ideas. But I think this would also cover things like using AI. However, I do use a thesaurus. I go to thesaurus.com and you might have a a book in your house, which is a thesaurus, which helps us find words. So is that cheating? I don't know. I mean, I use pro writing aids to help me edit my short stories. Is that cheating? No, I don't think so. And I don't credit pro writing aid in my novels either. So all of these are questions. I would like to know your thoughts. Uh, please email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com, with whether you think an ethical author should declare the use of a tool like GPT-3 and in what circumstances, because it's not a blanket one, as I said. So yes, I would love to know your thoughts. This is something I'm trying to create some kind of guidance on, I guess. So please email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com, with whether you think an ethical author should declare the use of a tool like GPT-3 and in what circumstances. Okay, as ever, these in between episodes are sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thank you to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. You guys basically fund my brain and give me some leeway to research and think about these bigger questions that are going to impact us all. If you'd like to support the show, go to patreon.com, P A T R E O N.com forward slash the creative pen. And for a, you can support the show with just a couple of pounds, dollars, euros a month, and you'll get an extra QA audio every month which is 45 minutes of Q&A for patrons only and you get to ask your questions. Okay let's get into the interview with Ash. Ash Fontana is a startup investor and managing director of Zeta, an investment fund focusing on AI. He's also the author of The AI First Company, How to Compete and Win with Artificial Intelligence. Welcome Ash. Hey Joanna, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you today. So let's start with a quote from the book. We thought AI Mm -hmm. was just around the corner for a long time, but it turns out that it was just getting started. Now, many people in my community think, oh, AI will happen in a decade or longer. But what are you excited about right now? And have things accelerated because of the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, look, in many ways, AI will happen in a decade or longer, and it'll keep happening for many decades going forward, we're just at the start of what I call the AI first century. We're only partway through that. So bringing it back to today, where are we in this AI first century and what's exciting today and what's changing today? You know, I'm still excited by a lot of the simple stuff, what we call supervised and semi-supervised systems in the field of AI. That is 
you know, a human is manually training the system, telling it what to do next, giving it examples to learn from, et cetera. And these systems are just so good at picking out things that you tell them to pick out, like clauses in a contract or anomalies in a stream of clicks on your website. And there's so much opportunity to just apply all of these things, these systems to all sorts of things today. I guess another uh, relatively simple at this point, or at least over the last five years, has become relatively tractable for most people, way to apply AI is providing a view on something using perception technology. So to bring it to a real world example, figuring out what's on a shelf in a grocery store, rather than having someone have to walk the aisles at 4am with a little machine. Or if someone is standing in front of a forklift on a factory floor, you know, you want to know that so that you don't, you don't hit them. They're just endless use cases in the real world from manufacturing to mining, uh, using the technology we have right now. I think if you were to consider what's next, you know, maybe not the next couple of years, but very soon after, the real opportunity is modeling complex systems. And so the way you do that is you construct a relatively simple, what we call an agent-based system. And so you have an agent, a little character in a, in a story, so to speak, You give them incentives and have a little environment with their constraints. And you can start doing things like saying, huh, how will this economy or this biological system or this virus behave if we give it these incentives and we have like some idea of the mechanism, but not totally. Let's see it play out. And so I think there's potential to apply AI to understand some of these complex systems that we really don't understand today. So they're probably the the two parts of the answer. Uh, I'm excited by some simple stuff today and excited next up by uh, modeling complex systems. I think you asked about acceleration in the pandemic, and I think things have definitely accelerated. You know, essentially, uh, we've had to figure out how to do some tasks like warehousing without people coming into contact with each other or without people at all. And so what we've had to do is use AI to map those processes in certain ways and then let AI learn those processes so we can use it both to map, so observe something and figure out, okay, what is the usual pattern of operations here in this factory? And then learn, okay, what is the output we're trying to achieve? And then even carry out those processes and and maybe learning things about that process that we missed. So again, like think about running a factory floor and all the things that happen. Can't really do that um, in the pandemic. People are at home and people are not really able to come into contact with each other at work. So we've seen a huge acceleration in the adoption of technologies that let you do that. We've also quite obviously had to come up uh, with solutions to some really big problems like designing new drugs. And I won't go into that now, but AI has definitely played a big role there. And then I think looking forward and just to wrap this up, on the consumer side, there's some really exciting ways people are using AI to help people learn things faster and quicker. So learn a new skill, learn whatever it is, like how to solve their mathematics problems in their grade seven homework all the way through to how to like reskill for a new career as people figure out what they need to do to re-enter the economy. So I'm pretty heartened and excited by that too. Yeah, and I think this is the exciting thing. Like you, you talked about, they're modeling complex systems. And some of the biggest problems of our planet, healthcare, mm. environment, education, these are the things mm. that could be transformed in such a positive way. But of course, mm. this is a podcast for authors and writers. So, mm. and I'm like, I do say to people, look, actually, most people don't care about writing books. This is not a big application of AI. But right. given that, given that's um, my audience, and you, so you're an author, mm. obviously, you have a new yeah. book, and, and, yeah. Um, the audience authors, how do you see natural language generation, natural language processing and generation mm-hmm. as part of the AI first company? Because that is accelerating a lot. And as you said, taking mm. sort of enhancing humans mm. is something that it does right now. Yeah. So I think I'll answer this question about how natural language generation can be used in companies in general. And then maybe later on, we can jump into authors and creative entrepreneurs in particular. So natural natural language generation, as you've covered on this podcast before, and as people have read in the news over the last year or two, is really picking up in terms of its ability to generate 
large segments of text rather than just a little sentence at a time, which we've been able to do for a while. But generating like sensible, sensical, and sensible sentences uh, in long sequences has been very, very hard to do. But uh, with both developments on the modeling side and on the computing side, more resources available, et cetera. We've made a lot of progress there, which is really cool. And you can think of how this could be useful in lots of different ways in most companies, regardless of the industry. Getting started on a marketing piece, you know, an AI could write or a natural natural language generation system could write 80% of the piece, the first draft, and then you craft it from there generating an agenda to make meetings more productive. We can look at who's attending the meeting, look at what they've written in their documents from previous meetings and generate an agenda or a starting document for a next meeting. They can map out charts, organizational charts. They can get most of the way in responding to people. So I think in most companies, natural language generation systems can just keep up the flow of communication without totally taking it over. And there's a lot of nuance into how it would do that. I think certain industries like media and marketing can certainly utilize natural language generation more heavily. And uh, it's, it's sort of already doing so, generating articles in fields where there's a lot of structured data, so sports and finance, which also happen to be the fields where delivering articles close to real time is really important. More more use increases the utility of the article. So that's quite cool to see. I think in terms of the publishing industry in particular, it's remarkable that a lot of people in the industry don't really have a great idea of what sells at a very specific level. You know, do carv- uh, books with orange covers or blue covers sell better? Well, that's, you know, a question you could ask most people in the publishing industry and they won't really give you an answer to it. They won't really know. But it's a question you could ask an AI very easily and it could very easily answer. Or even just looking at the content. Do books with checklists do better than books without checklists? Do books with long chapters or short chapters, lots of smaller chapters, fewer bigger ones, dip by genre. There's all sorts of information that the publishing industry could generate using natural language processing um, and then also natural language generation. But we can go more and more into that and you and I um, probably have lots of ideas there. But I, I think that's probably my where I'd start. Yeah, and I I think one of the problems is that people who have an interest in AI or people who have Mm. any sort of technical background don't go into publishing. Mm. (laughs) And then people like yourself and other more technical people might write books and then, uh, Mm. you know, talk to people in publishing. But the people working in publishing are not usually Mm. technical people. And and they also think that's kind of blasphemous to to even consider the idea of split testing a different colour. But you did tease us there with, like you said, about talking about specifically for authors and writers let's just get into that sure. now mm. yeah sure sure look i'll start with where you finished there which is the idea of split testing or whatnot the most exciting use of ai in the industry not just natural language processing and generation including natural language generation but the most exciting use of ai is the most boring but most impactful which is marketing your book things like writing short tweets and blog posts and figuring out which segments of the book are good to turn into a shorter piece that can be distributed for free as a teaser for the book. So generating marketing content rather than core content, rather than writing your book for you, I think that is the biggest opportunity for authors to utilize AI. And again, it's not as cool as thinking about an AI that could write a book, but I just don't think AIs are are going to write good books for a very, very long time. But I do think a lot of authors need a lot of help with marketing And especially if you're going down the path of self-publishing or whatnot, you'll need a lot of help. There's a lot of opportunity, but a lot of challenges there. And that's where I can jump in. And even if you think about the way people consume content and the way that media is changing, people want content in different sizes and on different media. So people want a one tweet summary of a book. They want a blog post summary. They want a five-page summary. They want a chapter-level summary. And AIs can generate all of those for you, as you probably know, as an author going through and generating all of those summaries, like distilling everything you've written down to that level is really hard, but AI could help with that. And then you can distribute it across all sorts of different media. You know, you could have an AI read it out for you in a five minute podcast that someone can listen to while they're doing the dishes, or you can have it read out your entire book 
or even a slightly shorter version of your book that's a one hour version, or it can generate an audio excerpt with a bit of a video, even generate its own illustrations to put in that video that you could post on Instagram. So if you think about both the summarization and language generation side of things, and then if you think about the way people are consuming content today, and then the imperative for an author to sell their content, to sell their book, you know, there's lots of really cool stuff that you could do combining a lot of technologies and distributing the output of those AIs across lots of different media types to basically sell more books, I think. That's really what you need to do as an author so you can keep supporting yourself and bringing new ideas into the world and pushing humanity forward, we hope. I think people will be encouraged uh, by you saying it won't write good books for a long time because yeah. that's what what people are worried about. But what is happening, of course, is people are using mm. tools like GPT-3 to, to help them write faster. And, mm. of course, we've got AI mm. translation. I'm just about to do my fourth German book with AI translation mm. first draft. So we are looking at uh, expanding the amount of work created with mm. these AI tools. So I wonder, mm -hmm. just going into data, because the book has mm -hmm. a lot about data, which is fantastic, because this is, yeah. you know, the, the sort of engine of, of the AI age, owning it, owning it, generating it, using it to power models. And you mentioned data brokers and licensing data, mm -hmm. which I'm very excited about, right? Because authors, as you mentioned, Authors and publishers have a lot of data, a lot of uh, words and intellectual property. So mm. what, is, what do you think are the prospects for licensing books in copyright for training language models? You know, has the horse bolted already, as in people are just doing this with no permission as such? Will uh, mm. licensing be sort of ready for that kind of thing? This is such a good question because it involves so much opportunity, but so many challenges in that. Yeah, if you think about the sort of businesses that have been built so far, licensing and broking data, uh, structured data, they're huge, like Bloomberg and Equifax and all these other companies make so much money by packaging up and selling structured data, data on people, on financial markets, on whatever else. But no one has really, well, not no one, but very few people have figured out how to package up and sell unstructured data, like text data, in quite the same way. And some of the technologies that we've talked about here today may allow you to do that. But as you said, the challenge is how do we do that in a way while still protecting the core asset? And you're right. Today, look, most people train these big language models on the tomes of publicly available text out there, whether it's out of copyright text or whether it's text that's in the public domain, you know, written by a government agency or just published for free online. That is the sort of text people use to train these language models today. But of course, if you're trying to train a model to write a really good piece of modern fiction, well, you want to train that on a piece of modern fiction that's still under copyright. So there is an opportunity here to I think build businesses, whether it's an individual author selling their content or whether it's a business selling multiple authors' content around selling unstructured text data to train models or even selling the models on top of them themselves. But we just have to be really diligent as writers to make sure our books aren't machine readable until we figure out how we can sell that content because otherwise, yeah, crawlers will will crawl them and use uh, use them effectively to train a model and then sell that model or sell the output of that model. And that's pretty hard to do, but we just have to continue to innovate on both sides of this, which is both on the natural language understanding and generation side, but also on the digital rights management side. That's going to be hard, but we have to not forget to do that. Mm. Yeah, because um, I... And I guess, oh, so I'll just have one more thing. Mm. You know, plagiarism is is rife and it's been rife forever. And so on the one hand, you could say, oh, well, there are no new ideas anyway, so we shouldn't take it very seriously. But on the other hand, like people's ideas are genuinely stolen all the time. I've had it happen to me. I'm sure lots of people out there listening have had it happen to them. And there's a huge opportunity to use AI to finally end plagiarism. You know, we can look at results from a competition that Kaggle ran um, to grade essays many years ago. Kaggle, for those who don't know, is the world's biggest community of data scientists and machine learning engineers, and they compete 
to solve really hard problems, you know, problems of identifying dark matter in space or figuring out if someone's got a heart condition and they use machine learning to do that. And one of the competitions on there was grading essays. And there've been various other approaches out there to sort of figure out if things are being plagiarized and grading them accordingly. And I think there is hope in using AI to make sure people's ideas aren't stolen because AI can analyze huge volumes of text and match them up pretty pretty easily. Yeah, and it's interesting because I, I think about this a lot. I mean, what's interesting about GPT-3, for example, is it, it's something like 98% is not plagiarized. Even though it's trained mm. on all this material, it comes up with, in quotation marks, original uh, work. Mm. And so I agree with you. I, I think there needs to be some kind of almost watermark. You know, they're talking about it with deep fakes, a way that mm. is put on the files in some form so mm. that you can tell what is generated and what is real. But this yeah. is, is becoming harder and harder obviously Mm. so the other thing I I did want to ask about uh, some of the more legal side because of course copyright law Mm -hmm. and protection of intellectual property assets this uh, you know China has granted copyright to an AI owned Mm -hmm. by Tencent I believe but Mm -hmm. this hasn't happened in the US UK Australia etc and but uh, it just seems to me that already this is going to become an issue because the legal Mm -hmm. aspects move so slowly compared Mm -hmm. to the technology. So what are your thoughts on copyright law and protection of of IP? Yeah, I mean, I guess the starting point is that anything generated by an AI is definitionally derivative. Um, It is data that's gone into a model that's done some sort of calculus, usually, not always, and derives something. And so we have concepts of derivative works and whatnot in copyright law today. And so I think there's a lot of different ways that courts maybe have and and will apply those concepts that we already have to the output of AIs, to the output of these uh, machine learning or otherwise models. Now, that's that's just a starting point. It does get a little bit complicated and nuanced, I guess, in that the output of, on the one hand, a heavily designed, almost rules-based system, which you could call an AI in some cases, could be said to be the work of the designer of that system, the data scientist or the machine learning engineer. And so you could say that, well, that's quite clearly the work of that person and anything generated by the AI is owned by that person or the entity that, that, that designed that system. And the good thing is in those cases, those systems are quite explainable and therefore the work quite provably that of the designer of the system. They write the rules and the system generates things, predictions, whatnot, based on those rules. So that's what we've got on the one hand. On the other hand, we've got systems that not just learn the underlying structure and whatnot, but learn the rules themselves. And so there's just many, many layers to the system, you know, Maybe it's a deep deep learning system, which is what deep learning means, like many, many layers to the, the network that's learning um, things across pieces of data. And it's less straightforward there, like how you would attribute the work. Is it attributed to the design of the system? You know, is the data on which it's trained at that point really playing much of a role in generating the output of that system? Probably not. And so this is where it becomes a really difficult question of degree of authorship. You know, certainly the input data was required and certainly some design was required in some of those cases, but certainly you can't track back to those two things, the data and the design of the system to explain the output of that system. And so therefore, could you say, well, you know, the owner of the data or the designer owns any of the output of the system or should own the output of that system? That's going to be really hard. So I guess in summary, a lot of the simpler AIs, I think, will uh, be protectable through traditional concepts or existing concepts of copyright law. But some of the newer ones, it's going to be pretty hard. 
Yeah, I, I agree. And my I was quite militant on this last year, but my attitude has changed mm-hmm. as I've learned more. And I just I feel now that you won't mm-hmm. be able to tell. So I might want to license my data. I've got over a million words of fiction, but a million words of fiction in in mm-hmm. book form. That's not much when you think about how much things mm-hmm. take to train models. So if if my work yeah. is sucked into a thing or your book is sucked into a thing, it will disappear in the mass of other models and we'll never even know that that it was used so I've been like okay well in that case Mm. let's focus on a different angle which is embracing this stuff and really looking to how we can use it which is now my attitude is right well let's let's think positively and get on with using this stuff instead of trying to Mm. prevent it being used so I did want to ask about Mm. the more creative um creative ideas so I find the generative adversarial Mm. network even though the word adversarial is difficult I think for creatives but the GAN idea fascinating as it's similar to this idea in my head of the creative first draft and then the editor, the sort of, I'm going to create this and then I'm going to edit it. I'm going to create this and edit it. And how do you think this type of generative adversarial network idea might help the creative entrepreneurs? Oh, in so many ways. I mean, firstly, just conceptually, it's so nice. I think of it like a debate. You've got a for and against. um, You've got two people debating. And as we know, like, that's how... I. I would argue most of uh, human sort of politics, human-based politics and governance and development has happened by people collaborating and people improving each other's ideas. Um, And so it's such a powerful concept. I think the first way it can help creative entrepreneurs and companies is in generating things that are just hard to otherwise get. So let's just say you need illustrations of 10 different types of chairs for your book about des- you know, chair design and some industrial design book. You know, maybe that's an easy thing to get. And so therefore, maybe it's not a great example. But if you just say, look, to again, uh, you know, all chairs have four legs and a seat and a back. Now go and just generate a whole bunch of them. It can do that. And, it, you know, a more pointed example would be something like generating lots of pictures of different different vehicles or whatnot that, you know, may be very futuristic and may like still resemble a vehicle, but be nothing like what we've ever thought about before. If you want to write a book about the history of, or, or the future history and future of vehicles or of warfare or something like that. So that's on the image side. And of course, you can think about this on the tech side, you know, just generating ideas that are based on concepts that we already have, but the output of which uh, is in the model's output of which we've never really thought about or is very surprising. And so you can think of human machine interfaces where you're going back and forth with one of these GAN based systems and coming up with new ideas, whether they're, you know, new ways to look at uh, an equation, new angles to look at an image, different light, different characteristics, or different ways to throw words together in a paragraph. I think it's, really powerful it's a really powerful concept and they're inherently creative is what i'll say uh, again Mm. on those images is that similar to open ai's uh new doll e uh that they've just introduced which you mentioned the chairs there it sort of said uh, create a chair and an an avocado chair and it's Mm -hmm. generated a whole load of images of an avocado chair some of which were obviously unusable but some of which were truly original which is just fascinating yeah, it is. Yeah, it's really fascinating. I mean, it's a combination of methods, I think. I haven't read that paper, but certainly seen it. It's a combination of methods, but that's that's an example. Let's take something that we already have a conception of and let's generate a version of it that we're, or two things we have conceptions of and generate something that we've never seen before. And let's think about what that means. Obviously, an avocado chair doesn't mean anything, but you can think of something like, well, let's take this concept and that's concept Here's a paragraph on each. What what do you think those concepts would mean if we talk about them together? And that's the sort of thing a GAN-based system could generate for you. And as I've been trying out the beta of GPT-3, it's fascinating Mm. that it comes up with stuff that I would not have thought of and using Mm. that to enhance my 
thinking as opposed to just copying it and pasting it. I'm using it more to yeah. enhance my thinking. And, and that to me is, mm-hmm. you know, that's what you were talking about at the beginning, that sort of enhancing human work. But uh, I mean, we're talking about lots of exciting things. And of what I really noted in the book was obviously your book is really aimed at bigger companies. So the AI first company, but of course, we're all micro companies. <laughs> and people listening, I'm a micro company. It's, it's just me. But I want to use all these tools. Now, you've mentioned lots of ideas, but are are there tools available right now to non-technical people who want to mm. make more revenue but don't want to have to employ a programmer or a data scientist? Yeah, yeah, very much so. And look, the book, I think, and I hope, is very relevant to people with less resources. You know, one of the premises of the book is you don't need a PhD in machine learning to get started with AI. And you don't need the million, multi-million dollar budgets of companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon that they have to devote to specific projects to get started with AI. You can get started right now because you've probably got a data set, whether it's your million words of fiction or whether it's all the clicks and interactions on your website or whatnot, that is perhaps able to generate uh, or you're from which you're able to generate some predictions about something that could be valuable to someone. And so, yeah, people can absolutely get started with AI with what, with what they have today. There are lots and lots of tools available to non-technical people. I mean, it's amazing to, you know, either use some of the tools provided by vendors today to turn lots of speech into text or to translate or all of your text in one language into another language, which you touched on before. And I will just say it's such a huge opportunity, you know, both commercially, but also for the good of the world to have all of the non-English speakers in the world to be able to access all the English written content would be amazing. There's so many people out there that could learn so much if they were able to access that content. So there are lots of off-the-shelf tools provided by vendors, but, you know, it's actually pretty straightforward to build a lot of your own stuff using tools provided by companies like Google and Amazon. You know, I haven't been paid to write computer programs uh, in a long time, arguably ever. And, you know, I can go on Amazon's side and start playing around with a lot of their products and APIs and some of their their coding gyms, so to speak, to train AIs. And it's very straightforward. There's a lot of really good stuff out there. And then, of course, the computing power and everything else is more freely available now. So, yeah, the the opportunity for one-person companies to be AI first is there just as it is for a million and thousand-person companies. Yeah, and I certainly, I really enjoyed the book. I found it really useful. I also think it's there's almost a language aspect of this. I feel like it's almost mm. like the finance industry. Like if you don't understand some of these terms, then mm-hmm. you think it's more complicated than it is. Whereas Absolutely. actually, you know, for example, you mentioned there the Amazon tools. So that's AWS. People can go to Amazon AWS and you go on their AWS homepage now and it is full of things you didn't mm-hmm. even know you could do easily. And yeah. as you say, they have made it aimed far less at technical people now. There are lots of of ways that you can do stuff. And I wondered, because the other thing I've been thinking is perhaps this is all just architecture. And as you say, we're in the middle of this AI century. Will we be, will we even use the phrase AI as the years go by? Or will it be like the internet? You know, you didn't publish your book on the internet, you published it on Amazon or your publisher put it on Amazon. Mm-hmm. So we, I don't say I put my books on the internet. And is will mm-hmm. AI just become part of architecture so we won't talk about it in the same way as the companies move forward? Yeah, I think so, absolutely. I think that it is something that will undergird all of the technologies that we use, You know, all of the software that we use more pointedly will become just that little bit more predictive. You won't just open your video conferencing um, application and see someone else's picture in front of you directly from the camera stream. It will have been processed by all sorts of smart systems to provide you with a better quality picture, better quality information about maybe what they're feeling or what they're emoting at that point. You might get an automated transcript. I mean, all of those things sound like things that might be in the future, but they're all actually happening right now. 
and that's just your video conferencing software. Your software that um, you use to manage your blog might write your blog for you and then might write it in 10 languages for you and then might figure out the best place to pay for a link back to that blog or whatever else. Your accounting software won't just take the entry you put into it and spit out a report. It'll just ingest all of the information it can from your bank account and email and whatever else and do it all for you. So it's it'll just become invisible. It'll become completely invisible. And that's what we hope, that a lot of these technologies are abstracted away so we can just live our lives just and with then- more, more, more time and money. Yes, <laughs> hopefully. But that, I think that is the question I want to en- end with, really, which is mm-hmm. the uh, ideal is, as you say, we'll have more time and more money and we'll, li- life will be amazing. And mm-hmm. we're obviously techno optimists in this way. Mm-hmm. A lot, But a lot of people are worried. For example, you talked about the warehouse back in the beginning. And what we have seen is, yeah, machines don't get sick. So if you mm-hmm. replace humans with the machines, uh, then, yeah, humans don't get sick, but humans also don't have a job. And I feel like that is the fear Uh, that people have and in the creative Mm. community there's a fear of a tsunami of ai generated content that pushes out the the real Mm. authors as such so how come you're so positive about this and so am i obviously but and how can others adopt this more positive looking mindset yeah look i think i always come back to two things leverage and optionality which is All technology is, it's a lever for you to do more with less. It's in the very Archimedean sense. You know, whether it is one of the very early pieces of technology, such as a wheel or a a scale or an axe or a trap, all of those things actually give us physical leverage over our environment so we can carry more with the same muscles on our body or so that we can reap more with the same amount of energy expended. That gave us leverage over our physical environment. You know, now we've moved to having leverage over intellectual things, and that allows us to develop more intellectual products for our own consumption, for enjoyment, or for the purposes of making a wage. And that's all technology is. It's, it's, it's a form of leverage and that gives you more from less and ai is just like any other of those pieces of technology it's a way to give you predictive leverage so it gives you leverage not over your physical environment and not over your intellectual environment gives you leverage over time because it can learn from the past to predict the future so it can help you bring things forward whether that is should i spend this money now or not or should i get this insurance policy or not Or will I have food on the shelf in a month or should I order it now? AI can help you develop more certainty around the future so that you get leverage over time. And that's really, really cool. It's a bit abstract, but you can just let that sit for a bit and think about how that might improve everyone's lives. And so that's one thing I always think about with technology, whether it's AI or software or, you know, networking technology like the internet or otherwise. And the other thing I always think about is optionality. Like, look, take it or leave it. But it's totally fine to not have AI in your life. I actually don't adopt AI for a lot of things in my personal life. I don't use Spotify to suggest music to me because I really enjoy the process of discovering music and discovering artists. I don't use AI um, to figure out what movies I want to watch. I've never used Netflix in my life because I enjoy the process of talking to my friends who study film and whatnot to figure out what movies I want to watch. And so it's totally fine to pick and choose where you will adopt it. And, you know, we certainly should be aware of that. I don't use my phone for a a whole day a week and for a certain number of hours per day. And we, we have a lot of technology in our lives and just pick up the right tool at the right moment when you want to achieve whatever goal you have. And when that's not the right time or moment, then just leave it on the shelf. That's how I think about these things. Mm, Fantastic. So the book is The AI First Company. Where can people Mm -hmm. find you and the book online? Sure. Um, The book you can find, obviously, on Amazon and all good booksellers. The website is AIfirst.org, AI-first.org. 
And I am Ash Fontana, A-S-H-F-O-N-T-A-N-A on Twitter and LinkedIn and all of those other places on the internet. So fairly straightforward and I hope people enjoy it. And I hope lots of different types of people enjoy it, whether they're just working by themselves or working in a really big company or working in their family business. Hopefully it's practical enough that you can take some of the checklists and illustrations and frameworks and apply them to something you're working on right now or thinking about or what you want to do next. That's why I wrote it, uh, to help everyone every day. So hopefully it does that. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Ash. That was great. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Ash and that it's given you some things to think about. I am certainly considering how I can become more of an AI powered micro business as technology continues to give us more leverage. We do live in crazy exciting times. I know sometimes this is a bit much, (laughs) but you know, we have to surf this change in order not to drown in it, as we always say. So if you have thoughts, as I mentioned before, about the ethical use of an ethical declaration, I guess, or whether it is even an ethical choice, the declaration of using tools like GPT-3, please email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com. And uh, I'd really like to hear from you what you think about that as I start to try and put together uh, some kind of coherent thought (laughs) on that. Uh, Okay, so on Monday's show, we're back on Writing Craft with Gail Carragher talking about the heroine's journey. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.